you got to have girlfriends. And we are really excited to be here today with our new girlfriend, Suzanne Braun Levine, who is such an important and influential person to women of our generation. And um, she's here today with some of her girlfriends. We have Karen Lippert, Eileen Williams, and Pat Wynn Brown. And I'm Daryl Pollock, and I'm here with Lynn Forbes from Woe. And I have to say, uh, this would really be fun to just be a fly on the wall at this at this conversation because um, these are all friends of Suzanne's, but I don't know that they've even all met each other. I don't think so. It's kind of like a lot of us where you have friends from different parts of your life. So what I'd actually love to do is to have, to start off so we kind of know everybody, have Suzanne uh, or anybody else jump in, but Suzanne, would you tell us how do you know each of these women and let's start with the person you've known the longest well first of all I want to say that you have become a girlfriend and uh, thank I'm you so happy that you're in this circle of trust um, you're very pushy broad I love that <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on I'm honored to be pushy and to be in a girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, Karen is the person I know the longest. We worked together at Ms. Magazine. Uh, she has always been one of these amazing publicists who not only is pushy, I think that may be a theme in my girlfriend. Uh, but, but because you need that. You need that. But, yeah, we'll get to that later. <laughs> But she also gets the issues, and she's passionate, and she's smart, and she is one of the few among my girlfriends who's kept up to date on the technology. So um, she's very important in my circle of trust. I want to say, by the way, a shout out to all of you, because everybody managed to get into this hangout. It's sometimes challenging. So I think all your friends, at least everyone here, managed to keep up with the technology today. Well, so. You well, we feel proud. <laughs> we feel very proud, and we thank Tracy as well on your team because she's oh, very so helpful. Oh, you're so sweet. Yeah, yeah, she'll love that. She'll love okay, it. so how do you know Pat? So how do you know Pat? I know Pat because we had the best time. She interviewed me at a transition network event in Columbus, Ohio, and um, I I thought this is going to be totally weird because she had she's a performer. Um, she does these amazing hair shows uh, that she will tell you about. <laughs> but um, we just took off and ha had our own conversation mm -hmm. and laughed and had a wonderful time. And at one point she said, aren't any men in the audience going to say anything? And nobody said anything. And then she said, I'll give a dollar. Or was it five dollars? <laughs> I think it was five dollars <laughs> to the, to any man who stands up, and sure enough, somebody stood up and uh, he got his five dollars. <laughs> he was and he was really very very mo and wonderful. He spoke really beautifully too, as I recall. He did, he did. But I think we should do that more often. We have to bribe them, I guess, to get into the conversation. And Eileen is a medium new friend. Uh, we met when I was on Feisty Side of 50, her, her wonderful blog talk radio show. And um, I don't know, she sounded so great, and we had such a good conversation that I found myself in San Francisco, where she lives, uh, with a couple of hours to kill. So we had lunch. And... Uh, it was a wonderful lunch. Uh, she very early on, um, uh, displayed her famous enthusiasm. <laughs> Did she jump on a couch? Yeah, right. She's been Press threatening to jump on a couch since we met her, like Tom Cruise. <laughs> Hold on a moment. <laughs> and um, I, I just love being her friend. Um, I've interviewed her for my last two books. Um, She's interviewed me about my books. Um, she picked me up at the airport the last time I was in San Francisco. 
And uh, it's just great to have her in my life. Well, it's amazing because it sounds like a bunch of, you know, it, it, like I think a lot of women's friendships, um, chemistry is, is a part of it. I mean, I don't even know if you could all define what it is that kind of pulls you together with some of these people who become your friends. It sounds like, well, Karen, um, you know, well, you and Suzanne go way, way, way back. back. Well, I think that one of the, I, I was thinking about that because I think one of the things that happened at Ms. is that we had a we had a shared mi mission about the women's movement, but we became a really close family because we used to always have called it the Ms. family because we learned a lot about each other and about women everywhere because our readers kept writing in, our writers came into the office. So we were learning a lot about being women and about what our feelings were and we were expressing them to each other. And I think that something like Woe does that today. I think that online Facebook and things like that do that today because women are connecting in very real ways. So we know a lot, you know, more about each other than the last generation ever did. And I think the women's movement moved that forward and I think the internet is is taking it to an even larger, you know, a larger world. Well, you brought up so many things. There's one I do want to ask you about because I think your experience at Ms. Magazine was really unique for that time. Um, I know that for me and most of my friends who are now my friends, we were competitive with each other. We were not bonded at all at those, you know, in those early years of our careers when you were bonding at Ms. It sounds really fortunate for you. So I'm kind of curious if you knew right away how important women's friendships were going to be, Suzanne, because for instance, I did not, and I think a lot of my friends would agree, we didn't really discover that until we were much older. Now we know. But in the early years, I don't think we would have known how important our women friends were. But it seems like you knew. I d no, not at all. It was, as Karen describes, the Ms. experience that taught me to trust women. I grew up in, yeah. the, in the culture where uh, women were not to be trusted. They were all at, we were all supposed to be after the same man. Right, fact, right. In fact, there was an understanding, I'm sure you will recognize this, that if you had an appointment with a girlfriend and a guy called, it was totally understood uh, that he took precedence. So the whole notion of valuing your friendship and trusting women, and there was also this mythology that uh, women uh, were devious and, and catty and... Uh, right went after the weak ones and all of that. So I had to, along with everybody else of my generation, unlearn all of that in the process of um, uh, changing the world side by side with women at Ms. and outside of Ms. Uh, as Karen says, the readers, the writers uh, uh, gave us an understanding of what women could do just as much as we may have given it to others. Could I just add one quick thing to that because I think one of the things that was so important was in the one of the, in the first issue of Ms was to have the uh, the uh, women acknowledge that they had had abortions. Mm -hmm. And that very fact that that was said so early in the magazine and it was one of the things that unite during the 60s when we were in when I was in college at Bard I mean it was one of the things that you shared with your girlfriends when you needed somebody when you needed to do that and you know being pregnant and all of those parts about our bodies and ourselves that became very much a part of the early women's movement were things that Miss started talking about very early so we got into ourselves and who we were in a very organic and very quick way. Interesting. That is really interesting and I think that's actually one of the ways women really do connect is that we we spill our guts you know yeah. and that's one yeah. of the ways we bond to each other. Right, right. And we were not competitive at Ms. because we all, as, as Gloria used to say, we all owned a piece of the, of the uh, pebble. <laughs> okay, it's, now that we have moved on in our lives, I think uh, talking about body image in particular and bodily functions, nice. I think that one of the ways 
that important ways that we are helping each other get through some of the indignities of aging is by uh, confessing that something is bothering us, laughing with each other, one-upping each other. Oh, you think that's bad? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. And um, I think, uh, I don't think my mother had that kind of support. Uh, I think aging was something that she was ashamed of. And, uh, as, as were bodily functions. Yes. <laughs> oh my God, yes. Well, you know, Time Magazine once had an article, the reason women have bladder issues later in life is that they are afraid to raise their hand to go to the bathroom at school. Oh, <laughs> I, th I think actually that we were so critical of the way we looked and our bodies when we were young um, that any fun we could have had from how great they looked or how much we enjoyed them was diminished. And now we don't look so great. <laughs> but we are... What? <laughs> what? Excuse me? <laughs> but, but that's, a, that's a question for Pat. But, um, but I think we are having so much fun. We feel so confident and authentic that uh, the hell with it. Uh, I, th I think we're much more comfortable with how we look, even though we may not look as good as we did back when we weren't so comfortable with how right, we look. Right. Right. I'd like to say something about that. I think the looser your skin gets, the better you feel inside it. I really do. <laughs> what's, what's that phrase about dropping and flopping? Oh. Flopping and dropping. You put that in your books, Suzanne. <laughs> I was just going to try and let Pat get a word in on the topic that, yeah. you know, what Suzanne yeah. was referring to. Yeah, because Pat has a little delay here, so we want to be sure she has a chance to talk. The shows that I do, the hair theater beauty school shows, they're, they're humor shows, and everybody graduates at the end, even the beauty school dropouts. <laughs> what I found is that uh, we talk about what true beauty is and it means having passion in life and being able to say your age. Women will not say their age so I always say my age, I'm 61 now and and you have to say your age or the terrorists win. So um, <laughs> we, we, we go through our classes of beauty school and then at the very everybody graduates but I, I, I have found, and they are all mostly women audiences, but more men are coming now. I and I have found that women um, of my age, of older, of younger, I mean, all the way down to 30, yes, a lot of men come now, and, and it's wonderful, but they, they're very dissatisfied with their looks, and they um, hate their hair. And they have bad hair days, and, and they could name everything that's wrong with their hair, every single thing that's wrong with their hair. Um, but I, I tried it with the shows through humor to learn self-acceptance and self-respect for whatever age we are. Because I have seen it time and time again that we are dissatisfied with our looks and our bodies. And I think the statistic is something like of 20-year-olds, uh, like something like 90% of them are dissatisfied with their bodies for 20 year olds mm. and, and this just keeps increasing as we get older so that's why I do the comedy shows and and that's why it was such an honor to get to meet Suzanne and, and to work with her at the event and to get to know Karen as well this has been just a, a real privilege for me well I think that's interesting in, in the book Suzanne I one of the points that I was most struck with was your the explanation about who the, the different yous that you are throughout your life when you have your children or you connect with women in different ways throughout your life and when you get to this part of your life you're authentically you and you're connecting with people who know the real you I, I don't remember exactly how you put it in the book and that we begin to sort of edit and massage our friendship circles to fit who we really are finally in the cycle I love the word edit. That's perfect. <laughs> it's nice. It's nicer than unfriending. It's right. right. <laughs> yeah, because you know you do. You talk this about about shedding shedding friends, which yeah. is another kind of unfriending. So, like, I, I'm curious to hear how that's been and why you think that's so important to do that. Well, this Suzanne. is yeah. Among other 
things. Uh, this is a period of shedding. You know, you'll say to somebody, what is your, what is the thing you want to do most when you retire? And they say, clean out my closets. This, this whole sense of wanting to get rid of stuff that doesn't matter, stuff you're not using, stuff that isn't you. Uh, in the old days, it would have been waist cinchers and, um, and stiletto heels. But there is something about reaching the age that we are, the fuck you 50s. I cannot Woo, love it. <laughs> love it. Everyone loves it. <laughs> but um, you just don't want to waste time. You don't want to get buried in irrelevant things. You don't want to hang on to shit. And you want to move forward uh, with your most positive uh, friends at your side. And this, this may mean shedding some friends who came into your life at a time when you were very useful to each other, the most common time being when your parents. Um, since I was an older mother um, and my friends couldn't remember pa parenting babies, um, <laughs> other mothers were so important to me. Um, but as you move on in your life, uh, these people who have been tied to you by life experience may not be able to move forward with you. The other kind of friends uh, that it's import more important even to uh, edit out are the people who are toxic, the people who've been um, making you feel kind of not so good all along, or who are always letting you down or not showing up. Um, not remembering things, or who just, there. at this point, it's also possible that while you want to move on, there are people in your life who don't want you to move on. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it, we need to evaluate our friends, and in the kindest way possible, and this is very tricky, I'm certainly not good at it, um, to move away. Uh, from people that you don't want in your posse for the next chapter. Well, it also could be that as you become your authentic self, that you really weren't your authentic self at the time you were friendly with some of these other people at earlier times in your life, and it just doesn't feel right. But I have a hard time with that, too. So where do Facebook friends fit in with all this? How do you, how do you think that's affected friendships for us. I mean, it's been great to be in touch, but I'm just curious what your experience is. Well, I think it's sort of demeans the word friend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it has made it possible for us to uh, get back in touch with a very important category of friends, which is people you knew when you were growing up, people you knew and lost touch with, but childhood friends, when you talk about authenticity, childhood friends can be so important in getting back to who you were, who you were meant to be, because they knew you before you became anybody. And just sort of to play off of their sense of you uh, can be wonderful. And the intimacy that came from growing up together never goes away. So. I think um, Facebook serves a very important function in that department. You know, I had a friend tell me recently, and Eileen, um, I wanted to ask you about your about your younger years too, your friendships that come from your younger years. But I had a friend say to me recently, she said, "You know, there's very few people in my life now who remember my mother and my father, <gasps> and remember the so block, yeah. remember the block and the house, uh, remember the school, and all those. There's very few people, and you're one of those only people who really remember." I was very touched. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that is so important. I I know that uh, in in terms of the women at Mez, there were a, a number of women there who who worked at the magazine, and it was a time at the start of the movement. So not everybody's family was excited that they were involved, but my mother was extremely extremely excited that I worked at Mez and came to see. Uh, the magazine and came down for events that we had and so people got to know her so that when she was ill they were there for me and they remembered how beautiful she was and how warm she was That's and great. all these things so it's it really is you know 
that was very, very key because I didn't have other people from other times in my life that who were that close to my mother in a way. Yes. And it really means a lot when they remember those things. It really does. What about you, Eileen? Do you have friends that, that go from way back? Yes, I have a, a really good friend that I got in the third grade, and uh, and I'm also very close to college friends too. I think that was that initial living away from home for the first time right. that draws you real closely. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add, Suzanne was talking about you know the as I put it, the flopping and dropping stage, but how we can laugh about these things. 